All right, the spontaneous pause has happened, so I should get going. Um, my name is Dave Skelly. I'm a professor of ecology here in the school and director of the Peabody Museum. And it's a great pleasure today to introduce a couple of great colleagues, uh, Greg Gilbert and Ingrid Parker, who are gonna be uh, speaking um, uh, on uh, plant pathogen networks and complex plant communities. I'm gonna start by introducing Greg. He's gonna be speaking first and then talk about Ingrid. Um, this is kind of opposite the, the order I got to know these folks. So Greg, I, I think I first met about 10 years ago when I was on an external committee uh, visiting UC Santa Cruz um, for the review of the environmental studies program where Greg is a professor. Um, he's been at UC Santa Cruz since 2000. Um, pr prior to that was on the faculty at Berkeley and prior to that was um, uh, uh, on, a, I guess, what was a postdoc uh, at um, Stry in Panama, where we have folks who have associations as well, um, and did his PhD uh, with um, at, at Wisconsin with uh, folks including Joe Handelsman, which ha who has a strong association here at Yale as well. Um, Greg's uh, work focuses on plant disease ecology. You're going to hear about that uh, today. Um, Greg also, uh, along with Ingrid, uh, helped to create a program which I have to read the name of because it's very long. It's got a great acronym. It's called the Santa Cruz Watsonville Inquiry-Based Learning and in Environmental Sciences Program. It was funded by the uh, NSF GK-12 program. And uh, what this was doing was putting uh, graduate students associated with um, Greg and Ingrid into um, uh, Hispanic uh, high schools where there were a high proportion of at-risk students one of those students was uh, Cesar Garcia Lopez, who um, ended up doing his work in, in my lab and was a fantastic student. And um, I have a high school senior right now looking at colleges. And so one of the colleges he's looking at is Yale. They sent us one of these big fat view books and I was looking through it and Cesar is in the view book. And I showed my son, I said, oh, you remember Cesar. And I said, and, and I said this is great that I made it into the view book because it mentions my name. And he goes, well, that's really about Cesar. So yeah, it is really about Caesar. So um, that was a great program that these folks put together for, for a number of years. So let me turn to Ingrid. Ingrid I've known for a lot longer. Um, Ingrid uh, was a graduate student um, after finishing her undergrad degree at Chicago. She um, moved out to uh, University of Washington in Seattle and we overlapped there where uh, she was a PhD student in Doug Shemsky's lab. And uh, I was a postdoc in Peter Kariva's lab. And in those days there was kind of this organic mishmash among um, the Kariva, Bob Payne, and Doug Shemsky labs, where it was sort of like a pseudo massive crazy lab. Um, and we interacted a whole bunch over uh, the years that, that I was there. And then um, Ingrid went on to be a Miller Fellow at Berkeley and then um, moved to Santa Cruz where she's been ever since. Um, both of these folks do excellent work. The one thing I'll tell you about Ingrid um, in particular is uh, she's kind of unstoppable. Um, when uh, she was a graduate student, she was doing her work at Fort Lewis uh, in, in Washington state. And that's, that's, the, that's like where the army works with tanks um, and they allow people to do research there. And one of her research sites, she had all these little plants, she worked on Scotch broom for her PhD and she had all these little plants marked with yellow, orange, green plastic toothpicks and then some bozo with a flamethrower on a tank came through and just incinerated her entire experiment. And all she had were these little plastic puddles where all of her plants used to be. And that did not stop her, nothing stopped her. And she kept going and um, did, did cry, which was totally acceptable. Um, and, and so uh, Ingrid and Greg approached me a few months ago about coming and spending time in the school. Um, one reason that they were interested in that is because we're great, right? And it's a great place to be. Another reason is that their son, Eli, is a senior in Yale College. And so this was a chance for them to spend a little time and get to see whether Eli has been exaggerating. And I don't think he has. Um, and so it's wonderful to have them here. Let's give them a nice warm welcome. Thank you, Dave, for the introduction, for the invitation to be here, for, for hosting us. Um, to all of you for coming. And uh, Ingrid and I are really excited to share some of our work on plant pathogen networks and complex plant communities with all of you. Um, there are sort of three themes or maybe take home messages from this talk. 
host range is the key to disease ecology. And then phylogenetic ecology is useful in predicting host pathogen interactions. And finally, community context shapes patterns of disease. So those are sort of the three themes that'll go throughout the whole talk. I'm gonna present the first part of the talk and that's laying the groundwork based on work that's been happening in our labs over the last actually couple of decades that leads to our most recent work and Inger will take over at that point and talk about that, exploring some of those ideas and, and concepts in uh, the context of complex plant communities. So fungal pathogens are ubiquitous in plant communities. Some of you may focus on the, the beautiful orange flowers here, um, but others of us are really fascinated by what's happening with, with diseases and symptoms on the plants. Now, diseases can attack all parts of plants, from leaves to reproductive structures or roots. And um, the impacts range from minor annoyances to the plant to death. Most plant diseases are caused by fungi here, uh, but there are also uh, plant pathogens that are bacteria, viruses, and oomycetes. And many of you may have seen on beech trees locally um, symptoms of really sad looking leaves like this in the last couple of years. This is a brand new disease called beech leaf disease. And this is actually caused by a parasitic nematode, uh, Litolenchus crenati. And uh, you should check out the work by Craig Broderson, his lab on, uh, on this system. So plant diseases are generally bad for the host. As disease severity gets worse, the probability of a host surviving goes down, its ability to grow generally goes down, its ability to reproduce um, generally goes down. But with that increased severity, it also increases the opportunity for the pathogens to grow and reproduce and spread to find new hosts and cause more disease. Most pathogens spread passively, many times by producing lots of spores that are released into the air or maybe splashed on, on raindrops or things like that. And that passive dispersal means that from a source of, of those, those, um, those propagules, those spores, um, the, the abundance of those propagules declines really pretty quickly with distance from the source. This creates maps like this, where we have in the middle, we've got a diseased plant shown in red. And then all those black dots are where the spores are dispersing to, with lots of them close by and fewer and fewer as you go farther away. This kind of a pattern uh, is continued over here. And the, as maps of going across the top here, three different, let's say, tomato fields. And the tomatoes are shown as these um, uh, open green circles at high density, one meter spacing, one and a half meter spacing, or two meter spacing, lower density. And in each of these, we start with a plant that's diseased in the middle, makes a bunch of spores. And if a spore happens to land on one of those susceptible plants, it turns orange when it's infected. You can see that there's a number of plants infected here at the high density and only one new one over here at second, uh, uh, the two meter spacing. Once those plants are infected, they can produce more inoculum, which spreads from those plants to potentially other ones. Whoa, what just happened? Don't know. Um, and so in the next generation of spores, we see a uh, much increased amount of disease here in generation two compared to in generation, uh, the, the lower density. And uh, here really lots and lots of infected plants and only a handful at the low density. So because plants don't move around, they're in the infection and uh, is dependent on pathogens that are spreading between the plants passively, and they're more likely to get be to plants that are, are close together. And this creates a really common phenomenon in plant disease of density dependence in plant disease. You have proportionally more disease incidence in high density situations than in low density situations. So this is important for tomato farmers, but it's also important in wild systems. That's because Plant populations are more prone to disease when they're growing in high density. That means that locally rare species should have an advantage over common species. 
And this is a potential mechanism for spatial and temporal maintenance of plant species diversity in wild communities. People have been looking at this question for a long time, starting back in 1959 with J.B. Gillett, and then continuing with a more well-known work by Jansen and Connell and other luminaries like Harold Augsburger and Dim Vanterputen, Jim Beaver, and Yale's own Liza Comita. There's been tons of work on how this density dependence of pests and, and pathogens can help to shape uh, species diversity in wild communities. It's all based on this idea of density dependence, but there's an important assumption there, and that's that pathogens are specialized on the focal hosts. So that implies that all those other plants out there are irrelevant. So this system, this idea of, of, um, of uh, local rarity and density dependence suggests that we should see this pattern of uh, numerical rarity with host specialist pathogens um, leading to each of the different uh, uh, host species in an area being um, uh, affected by the pathogens that are developing those systems in more or less proportion to how abundant they are in the system with very few pathogens uh, being produced and spreading in this rare poppy here, but lots and lots of pathogens and higher disease pressure in those species that are more abundant. So that's the individual-based density-dependent model. However, if we go into real plant communities like the lowland Panama rainforest where I worked for, for many years, we can um, look at diseases on pretty much any plant you look at. So lots and lots of disease there. So back in 2007, Cam Webb and I did this experiment. We took a lot of those plants from a patch of rainforest, a little bit bigger than the size of this room, in several patches like that. We isolated the pathogens that were associated with each of those diseases and then did reciprocal inoculations of the pathogen onto all the other hosts that were around it. And so we did that for each of these system, these uh, species, and, and in this particular case, 40 different fungal pathogens that were each inoculated onto up to 36 other species all in the same area. What we found was that many of the pathogens there are polyphagous. They attack a number of hosts. So this graph shows on the, um, the uh, axis, it's a histogram of the number of fungal species that were tested. And each of the bins is the proportion of the hosts on which those pathogens were inoculated that were susceptible, that developed disease. And there's one pathogen out here that caused disease on every single species we inoculated it onto, really broad generalist and two here that could only cause disease on the host from which we inoculated, uh, locally highly specialized. Many of them, most of them, were somewhere in the middle. They were polyphagous with the median pathogen causing disease on a little over a quarter of the tested local host species. There's a caveat here. This was only done with foliar necrotrophs. So fungi that infect leaves kill the tissue in order to colonize it and, and then reproduce. That's their, their life history strategy to do that. It's a particular kind of way to be a pathogen. And our inoculation methods really favored the fungi. It was, we, we did everything we could to say, if you can cause disease on this plant, go ahead and do it. So we wanted to know how broadly generalizable this pattern of polyphagy was. And we um, worked with uh, two USDA scientists, Roger McGarry and Carl Suter, and this wonderful database that they have at USDA APHIS, the PPQ, PPQ Global Pest and Disease Database. This is a highly curated database of the host ranges of plant pests and pathogens, lots of different kinds of pests and pathogens, um, and the, the hosts on which they are known from, from all over the world. This is different from the USDA database that some of you may know about the, the uh, USDA fungus plant host database, I think it's called, which is broadly available to the general public and not very well curated. Um, so using this database, looking at 210 different angiosperm genera and lots and lots of pests, we found similarly that about um, 
a number of species were limited to uh, a single host genus, although all of them were able to attack a number of species within a genus. But many of these, 45% of all of those pests and pathogens were polyphagous, ranging from a handful of genera to hundreds of genera. So in general, the, the same pattern tends to apply. Many, many of the pathogens that are out there tend to be polyphagous, able to attack a bunch of different hosts. And they're not really host specialists. So if plants are sharing their pathogens, what does that mean? That suggests that we should see some kind of community spillover from abundant neighbors. So here's the, that poppy, and it's got a bunch of pathogens that it's going to be uh, uh, that are going to be developing uh, within its own population. But we're also likely to see some species, maybe a quarter of them, I don't know, um, that are pro providing inoculum that's also going to be infecting that poppy. And one way to think about this, maybe they're just coming from the most abundant species around them. They're sharing those, those things. But it's only some subset of that community that's providing inoculum pathogens onto a particular focal host. But what's important is that which local plant species a pathogen can attack is not a random subset of the community, of the plants around it. We know this intuitively. A, a gar any gardener or farmer would know pathogens that come from a tomato plant are more likely to also infect a potato plant than a cabbage. And that's because closely related plants are more likely to share the traits that affect how they interact with, with microbes. And that suggests that closely related plants are more likely to share pathogens than our distant relatives. And we know this from a couple of different um, uh, lines of evidence. Uh, this is a figure from an annual review that Ingrid and I wrote a number of years ago, where we went through the literature to look at traits that are important in microbes and in plants that are related to how they interact with each other. And we looked to see uh, what was known in the literature about the phylogenetic signal in, in those traits. And phylogenetic signal is just that the plants that are more closely related to, or organisms more closely related to each other should be more likely to share that trait than our organisms that are more distantly related. And in fact, most of the traits show this phylogenetic signal. All the traits that are shown in blue show a, signif a significant phylogenetic signal in the literature. Those few things that are shown in black do not show phylo or show that do not have a phylogenetic signal. So overwhelmingly, um, most of the, the, the important traits seem to show a phylogenetic signal. And that suggests that we might be able to see that same, when you bring them all together, that same kind of phylogenetic signal in the host range of the pathogens. And we did this in two ways. One was um, experimentally, and the other was using that same USDA database that I, I just mentioned, and that's what's shown here, and uh, analytically. And what we find is, um, the probability of any two plant species sharing a pest is very high if they're closely related to each other, short phylogenetic distance between those two species, and it declines rather rapidly and, and then flattens out here in this phylogenetic signal. So we see a uh, high probability of sharing pests, a particular pest when you're closely related and then declining with, um, with farther distance. And this is consistent across all different kinds of, of pathogens. And it's consistent with the, the um, work that we've done experimentally to test this as well. So that suggests that, this, that in addition to um, the uh, uh, abundance, the rarity based just on abundance and density dependence being in, important in uh, developing disease and, and sharing, we, we might be able to see some kind of phylogenetic signal here, this phylogenetic rarity, and that we should mostly see spillover pathogens from close relatives onto a host. So if we start off with this poppy again, poppy is likely to be uh, pathogens that are able to infect itself in a internal cycle, that den single species density dependent, but its closest relatives over here, these legumes, species D and E, are also reasonably likely to be sharing their pathogens. So whatever's developing in those, they might be coming onto here. However, these more distantly related plants, like these grasses over here, or the even more distantly related ferns over here, are unlikely to 
the harboring populations of pathogens that are able to infect our target poppies right here. So where does that bring us to now? Because many plant pathogens are polyphagous, we know that pathogens can spill over from one species to another, and that's especially going to happen uh, among close relatives. All those neighboring plants out there really are not irrelevant after all, so we need to be thinking about them. This means that plant species can be rare in two different ways. When numerically, that basic single species density dependent idea and phylogenetically rare. And we would expect that phylogenetically rare species, those that don't have close relatives around them, would have less disease than those with many close relatives. So we wanted to know, can we predict that community disease pressure, pathogens coming from the surrounding species, on, on a species based on its phylogenetic distances to all its neighbors? And we tested this in the meadow community on the UCSC campus. So this is part of the UCSC campus. This is the Monterey Bay. And that's our house right there. So UC Santa Cruz campus is just, it's a wonderful, beautiful, very special place to live. Um, we are at the north end of the Monterey Bay in California. Um, and the campus itself uh, has the southern part uh, filled with grasslands, um, a working farm, uh, an arboretum. The middle part has all the academic buildings and the northern part of the campus is uh, mostly forested. And these are all part of the living laboratory of the UCSC campus. Uh, we're gonna be looking throughout the talk at the forest, the meadow and the farm uh, uh, when Ingrid uh, takes over. But right now we're gonna be mostly focusing on what's called the great meadow. So, we tested this idea in the meadow um, by first going out in the meadow and in 10 different, uh, fairly large plots, um, surveyed the abundance of all of the species in the meadow. And we did that with percent cover. We created a phylogenetic tree based on an APG background. So we knew the phylogenetic distances among each of the different species in the study. And we measured how much above ground disease these plants uh, were, were suffering, the severity of disease in all of those species. <clears throat> so for each of the species in the community, we wanted to uh, gather data that allowed us to look at the, um, the impact of disease, the pressure, the severity of disease here as a function of its phylogenetic rarity in the system. To do that, we looked at the distribution of phylogenetic distances of each focal species to all the other species around it. Now, there's lots of ways of looking at phylogenetic distance in the community con context, uh, looking at mean and medium or nearest, uh, closest relative distances. But they actually, most of those measures are somewhat problematic when you look at a, the perspective from a focal species to its surrounding community and a sort of one-to-many system. And so here, this is um, the phylogenetic distances between from a focal species to all the other species in a community. And it, they're in order from the closest to the most distant in a, a quantile uh, array. One of the problems is that there are lots of ways for a plant to be distantly related to other plants and only a handful of ways locally to be closely related. You can have lots of distant relatives, but only a few that are in the same genus or family or something like that. So that means that for many, a, a large proportion of all of those distances um, in, out there, they're very long phylogenetic distances. And those distances tend to overwhelm the, um, the mean and median distances. At the same time, if you just look at the closest relative, it's very idiosyncratic. You just happen to have one, one maybe rare in, uh, species uh, uh, that's in the same genus. That suggests you have, you're very closely phylogenetically related, whereas maybe you're not from the rest of the community. So after a lot of different kinds of attempts, we just, we came up with this, what we find is the best discrimination at the 10th quantile. And so if there were a hundred plants out there in the field, the 10th distance would be this 10th quantile distance. So that avoids a lot of the problems that we have with the other measures. And we actually published a exploration of why to use this kind of a, a metric uh, 
uh, last year, um, if you're interested in, in those kind of measures. But this is the measure that we're going to be using for our phylogenetic distance from the community. So we predicted that in this system, that uh, for each, uh, for all the species, the amount of disease pressure that a, a species uh, should see, the severity, should be high for those species that have close relatives, lots of close relatives around it, and very low for species that are phylogenetically rare in the system, that don't have close relatives. And in fact, that's what we found. So we found that disease pressure was lower out here on species that are phylogenetically rare than in those that have a lot of close relatives. Each circle here represents a species in the community. The error bars are determined based on those 10 different plots that are scattered around the meadow uh, for their phylogenetic rarity and the uh, uh, percent uh, disease that they, that they saw. So this graph is based just on presence and absence of those other species in the surrounding community. But we can also take the relative abundance of those species and weight them by their phylogenetic distances. So close relatives, um, whatever abundance ha would have, would have a bigger impact than distant relatives at the same relative, uh, same relative abundance in the system. And so when we did that, we can look at this community-wide host abundance. So that's the summed uh, weighted abundance of all the other species in the community. So species out here, would have a lot of close relatives, and species over here would have no or very few close relatives in the system. And we see a, a, a very nice fit with the more close relatives you have in the system, uh, the, the better, the more likely you are to be diseased. This is a much better fit than just looking at those single species density effects. So the community context here is really important in disease spread. So coming to the end of, of the, the first part, that background information. Uh, so the conclusion from part one is density dependence plays an important role in disease. Many plant pathogens are polyphagous and there's a phylogenetic signal in their host range and phylogenetic community context affects disease pressure. And with that, I will turn the stage over to Ingrid. <laughs> All right, so this is where we started. Fungal pathogens are ubiquitous in plant communities. And what we wanna do now is sort of unpack the messy complexity of what's going on in the interactions at the community level. So one of the um, ways that we can think about this that's useful is considering these interactions as uh, complex networks. And if we use the network framing, then that allows us to access certain kinds of uh, analytical approaches, as well as just a framework uh, that pulls all together some of the things that Greg has been, has been talking about. So for example, host specificity may vary across uh, pathogen species in the community. And if you take the reciprocal perspective and think about it from the plant, um, the plant's viewpoint, some plants may have just one pathogen that they're dealing with. Other ones may have large suites of pathogens that um, are affecting them. So we know a lot about individual plant pathogen interactions, but we know surprisingly little still about the structure of these interactions overall in plant communities. And uh, if you're, there's so many cool questions about plant pathogen interactions at the community level. And if you're interested in doing a shallow dive into that at all, I would point you to the community ecology part of the book that um, we just finished writing this summer. It just came out, we're very excited about it. So I wanted to make a little digression. Um, we've been, uh, this has been a passion project for the last five years. And here's a picture of Greg up in a tree, that's his favorite place to write. And here I am more conventionally writing in the home office. But anyway, all of that came together. Finally, this book just came out this summer and it is already available at the Yale um, Library. Um, this is also a good opportunity for me to mention uh, a very important collaborator on all the work I'll be talking about next. And that is Asa Conover. He was our lab technician and is now a PhD student at UC Berkeley and continuing as a collaborator on this work. Okay, so as Greg mentioned, we have this fantastic um, 
campus that is really a mosaic of different plant communities. And what we did, you've been hearing about the meadow, um, but what we did was actually look at the, the whole totality of interactions between plants and their fungal pathogens across all three of these community types, the meadow, the a working organic farm, which actually has quite high plant diversity, um, and the understory of the mixed evergreen forest up at the top of our campus, which is dominated by Douglas fir, redwood, tan, and tan oak. Um, so we didn't, we're not gonna compare these communities per se, but think about them more as representative communities to see whether the kinds of patterns that you might pull out of interactions between plants and their pathogens are consistent across them. Okay, in each of the communities, we wanted to represent all of the plant species. So we included all of every species that we could get at least five individuals from. And those five individuals were collected in, in a pseudo random way, kind of distributed across the um, geographic area uh, of the sample site. We combined those five individuals and then surface sterilized them. And we did that so that we could look at the fungi that are growing inside of the plant. So we wanna look at the, mic the microbiomes inside of these organisms and not just include um, any spore that was lying on the surface of the leaf. We extracted the total DNA and then amplified up the fungal ITS region. We used PAC bio sequencing. And the reason that that detail is important is that that gives you long reads, which are actually very important for identifying fungi. So if you're interested or you are doing this kind of work, um, that's I'm happy to talk more with people about that later. Then we're uh, gonna use these DNA sequence, the DNA sequence data as uh, barcodes for uh, doing what we call metabarcoding analysis, where you're using the DNA sequences to look at all of the community members um, in your environmental sample. And you take those sequences, you define OTUs, which I will use interchangeably with fungal taxa or fungal species. Um, we did that. Uh, using a phylogenetically agglomeration uh, process. And then you can take those sequences and figure out what species they are. And the way that you do that is by relying heavily on amazing work that the global mycology um, community has been doing where they have this UNITE database that is curated where mycologists take uh, uh, publish the sequences of fungi that they know what they are. And then you take your random sequence data and you uh, check it against the database to get that species list. Once you have your species or genus identification, then you can go to another database, the Fungill database, which uh, is another curated database where fungal ecologists and mycologists have put up information about what the functional roles are of all these different fungi. Um, and so we used Fungild uh, as well as our own knowledge of our local knowledge of the fungi in this data set to um, associate life histories with these taxa. So um, we actually have a much bigger data set of all of the fungi associated with these plants, which include some mutualists and a lot of uh, decomposers and things. We're not going to be, I'm not going to be presenting on those. I'll just be talking about the subset of fungal species that we know are either um, known or probable pathogens. Okay, and this cool data set, which I will say like, this is the very first full-length seminar we've ever given on this data. So this is really exciting new stuff for us. And we're gonna get a chance to work on it while we're here on sabbatical at Yale. So this is all very exciting. And if anybody has ideas or questions and you wanna talk it over, we'd be super excited to do that. But it's gonna allow us to ask some really neat questions, including, which show more habitat specificity, plants or fungi. So we've got three different habitats. Um, we're really interested in sort of uh, ways of looking at spatial specificity and uh, geography. And so anyway, we'll be able to talk about that. We'll be able to talk about some of these network structure things like how specialized are fungi to particular hosts. And then on the plant side, how many pathogen species does an individual plant deal with at a given time? And then we're also able to look, uh, at, to, uh, look at some of those questions that Greg just introduced having to do with phylogenetic ecology. So do evolutionary relationships among plants predict pathogen sharing? And 
the ecological implication of that in plant communities do phylogenetically rare hosts escape their pathogens. Okay, so just to orient you to the data set, these are species accumulation curves. So what you've got here are the number of host species that were sampled and how many fungal OTUs or fungal taxa do you get from that sample. And you can see that as you increase the sampling, you're getting more and more fungi. The important thing is that those curves are still going up. They're starting to flatten out a little bit, but it, when the fact that they're still going up means that there's still lots of fungal diversity out there that we didn't even get a chance to see even with all of that sampling. Um, but there's enough here to be able to say some, to notice some general trends. One is that the forest, uh, the fungi in the forest is a little bit higher diversity than that in the meadow and the farm is kind of in the middle. And you can also see from these that we sampled, we had a lot more plant species in the farm than the other um, habitats, which is kind of interesting. So this data set, first, first we're gonna look at habitat specificity. So we've got farm, meadow, and forest, and we wanna know um, what are the species that are found in just one of those habitats or in multiple habitats? So these Venn diagrams are showing that, for example, so these are percentages. So around like 12% of the species uh, that are found on the farm are also found in the meadow, et cetera. And overall, for the plants, about 20% of them are found in more than one of the habitats. What's really interesting is if you compare that to the fungi. So the pathogens here, uh, a full like 50% of them were found on plants in more than one habitat. So that means that these fungal pathogens are spreading pretty widely across that geographic range. So there's like beyond host specificity, there's also this fact that they're moving uh, across the landscape. And there's some really interesting implications of that. If you think about, for example, spillover, pathogen spillover from agricultural fields into wildlands that are nearby or other or, or the other direction, which is something that farmers think a lot about is like, where, what are the sources of pathogens that might infect my crop? I know a lot of you are also interested in urban ecology and there's some really interesting questions too about habitat mosaics and how urban systems might also play that kind of a role. So that's one aspect that is pretty interesting. So if we think about the structure of the networks now, um, we can represent these complex networks and uh, what we call a bipartite, these are what we call bipartite networks. So bipartite networks are where you have one whole group of organisms here, the pathogens uh, interacting with a whole different set of organisms, the plants. And we tend to represent these with boxes, like these blue boxes are the pathogens, green boxes will be plants. And if this pathogen is found associated with that plant, then it's gonna have a line between it, right? So if I show you um, the you know, like simplest network that we can put together from this data set, this would be just the fungi in the Puccinia micatina. So just the rust fungi found on plants in the meadow. And you can see that what this is showing is that there's this one rust species that's found on lots of hosts, another one that was only ever found on one host species. And then you've got other ones that are, you know, sort of different levels of host specificity. So that's um, kind of how you read these diagrams. And this is what the whole community of plant fungal pathogens on just the meadow plants looks like. So it gets kind of hairy, um, but this is the street. You can still see these kinds of patterns, some big host generalists, some host specialists. And we can use this now to think more generally about questions like how specialized are the fungi to particular hosts and how does that vary across fungi? All right, so here are the data. Um, on the x-axis now, we've got categories of numbers of hosts, and these are histograms. So these are percentages of the fungal taxa found in these different categories of, of numbers of hosts. So this bar here would be like all of the pathogens that were found on two or three hosts. So if you look just at the first bar on the left, um, you can see that somewhere between a third and a half 
of all the fungi were found associated with just a single plant species. Um, and while we're thinking about how to interpret that, first I want to mention that um, one of the issues with a data set like this is that we cannot distinguish between host specialization and rarity. So if you've got a fungus that just shows up once on one plant, you're, you can't tell whether that's a true host specialist or not. And that's always a problem for these kinds of data sets where we're trying to look at host specialization in a community data set like this. But it's especially a problem for our data set because we combine the five individuals of the plant species. So that's just something to keep in mind as a caveat. But um, in general, like most of the fungal pathogens had less than eight host species. So there's a lot of polyphagy, but there's also not, a, they're not like huge host generalists in general. So now we're gonna look at that for the plants. So, what do you think the pattern would look like? Do you expect the plants to also kind of have a similar shape where most plants are interacting with just maybe one or a couple of, pat of, of symbionts and other ones are, and a few are, are more common? Actually, it's really different. So um, these shapes, the shapes of these curves are really different. Most plant species had between one and two uh, dozen pathogen species associated with them. And very few of them had one or two, just one or two pathogens. I think this, I'm, we're still sort of mulling over all the implications of this, but I think it's really interesting if you think about how these kinds of, this, these kinds of asymmetries might influence both ecological dynamics in the community as well as evolutionary dynamics. So any given plant is gonna be dealing with many more symbiotic partners than the, the fungi that are infecting them. Okay, so that brings us to uh, phylogenetic ecology. And so now we're gonna ask whether this evolutionary relationships between uh, plants are predicted or predict pathogen sharing. And as you saw this before, our, you were expecting that close relatives are going to be the ones that are sharing pathogens. And um, what's really cool with this databa database is we're finally able to actually look at the identity of the pathogens at the community level. So our prediction here is that pathogen sharing should decrease with the phylogenetic distance between the hosts. And the way we looked at that was looking at the beta diversity between the pathogen communities on this plant host and that plant host. So the expectation is the more divergent those two hosts are, the more dissimilar their communities should be. And so here we've got break Curtis dissimilarity, so beta diversity between the two communities of fungi. And as you move to the right, we're looking at more divergent hosts. And it turned out very cool, we think, um, that actually the prediction holds up very clearly in all three plant habitats. Okay, so finally, now what about these ecological implications of phylogenetic structure in host sharing? Um, this was the, the graph that Greg showed you before that was based on the phenomenology of plant disease pressure. So how much disease are these plants experiencing? And we found that um, as they got to be more distantly related from the other members of their community, they had less disease. That was really cool. And our hypothesis always was that that was because they shared fewer pathogens with their community, but we couldn't nail that. Like we didn't know for sure that that's what was going on. That was an implication. And now we can look at it for real. So we were super excited to be able to look at this. And what we have, so our prediction is that our phylogenetically isolated plants. So again, that we're gonna use the PD-10 metric that, um, distance uh, sort of number of close relatives you have in your community will have, uh, and as you get become more distant from your community, you'll have fewer pathogens than species with many close relatives. And this is what we got. So as you go to the right, plants are more isolated from their community and they had fewer fungal taxa. So very cool. And like I said, we're just kind of at the beginning of exploring uh, these patterns and all the things that they mean. So in conclusion from part two, uh, 
the pathogens showed less habitat specificity than their plant hosts. Um, that has some interesting implications for pathogen spillover across the landscape. Um, most fungal pathogens had fewer than eight host species, but most of the plant species had one to two dozen fungal pathogens with some interesting implications for both ecology and evolution and the interactions. And then phylogenetic distance, predicted pathogen sharing, and that had this really important ecological uh, co uh, consequence that phylogenetically rare hosts escape their pathogens. And finally, I just want to say another really cool thing to us was just we didn't have expectations going in on how about how much variation there would be among these communities. We didn't intend, like I said, to have like to do a formal comparison between farms and forests since we only have one of each. But it was really interesting to us how similar the patterns seem to be across these communities, even though they have like a fourfold difference in plant uh, diversity, as well as like every other difference you can imagine between what a forest and a farm, right? So many differences in terms of the structure of, of the communities and yet very similar um, interaction interactions at the broad scale. Okay, take home messages from today. Host range is a key. Phylogenetic ecology does predict some interesting things about host pathogen interactions. And you don't have to be a plant person actually to study this. There's really similar cool tools look, uh, where you can get um, like these global phylogenetic trees of all the mammals and all the vertebrates, for example. So if you're interested in doing this kind of work, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. And then finally, community context shapes patterns of disease. And with that, I want to thank everybody, especially our uh, collaborator, Asa, and our whole team that worked on the project. I'm going to bring Greg up here if we have time for some questions. If anybody has any questions, raise your hand. Very interesting talk. Um, I'm, I'm just curious about the allelochemical composition of the plants and how important that is in driving sort of this coevolutionary relationship and and how that even fits in sort of the relationships between um, the phylogenetic patterns you see with associated plants that are similar? Great question. So yeah, so the plant chemistry is such an important, I we think, such an important component of the traits of plants that influence that phylogenetic signal in their susceptibility to pathogens. And so um, I several there were several chemical traits on when Greg showed the um, the work from the annual review that looked at the phylogenetic signal of all these different traits of pathogens and plants that might influence that phylogenetic signal and susceptibility. And plant chemistry is a huge plays a huge role in that. I mean, the plant immune system is complex. Um, and there are a lot of chemical aspects of that, some of which are very evolutionarily labile, so they change very rapidly, and other ones are really found foundational to whole lineages of plants. And so I think in some of the deeper, you know, family-related or slightly deeper than that even, chemical traits like the, um, you know, in the Brassica family or in the Solanaceae, like their chemical profiles and things are really important and very phylogenetically in um, informed. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering if there are any well-known examples um, of either introduced plant species or perhaps even new cultivars new, um, um, serving as evolutionary sort of stepping stones of pathogenicity in, in sort of the short term over a few generations. Oh, Ooh. cool question. <laughs> that, that is a cool question. Um, Vaguely related to that, we didn't talk about it today, but the uh, the meadow experiment that I talked about had a whole other component where we put novel species out into those things and found that we could we could predict using our formulas how likely they were to be diseased. And those that had lots of close relatives got lots more disease and those that were distantly related hardly got any disease at all. So it there's a there's a spillover onto those novel things. Examples of like a, an evolutionary transformation and then spill over? Um, we've done some reviews. Um, well, we've done some reviews looking at the, pro 
one of the kind of related things for is biocontrol also and where you where they use pathogens for biocontrol and they're very interested in sort of what are the evolutionary dynamics of pathogens that might be brought in on one thing but change over and um, it turns out that it seems that the ecological aspects of spillover seem to trump a lot of the evolutionary dynamics at least the ecological pieces seem to be very important at least early on um, kind of another thing related to your question is we have done a bunch of um, experimental evolution studies where we put local California pathogens on introduced plants and look at how the pathogens change over time. And we do see very rapid, we have seen very rapid evolution of the ability to infect. Uh, now these are like different varieties of the same plant species, but pretty rapid evolution of the ability to infect a host. But interestingly, the um, it different, not as much of a change in the virulence on the host. So anyway, that's a whole story for another day, but great question. Okay. Just, th just thinking out loud. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. That was really fascinating. At one point you mentioned that plants could have a dozen to two dozen fungal pathogens at any given point. Did you ever see examples of those pathogens ever competing within the plant to infect the plant? And if so, did that have anything to do with the, I don't know, phylogenetic rarity in the sample? Yeah, that's a great question. And we didn't do that kind of work in, in this particular setting. There's lots of examples out there of, of pathogens and other kind, all kinds of microbial symbionts competing with each other in the plant. And, um, different pathogens in the same plant, either enhancing disease or inhibiting one or the other. Lots of examples of that happening. I'm sure that's happening here. One thing that is important to, to think about is we've designated these as pathogens because they're likely pathogens on some plants. And sometimes. And sometimes. So the environment is, is hugely important whether they actually cause disease. What we know is that they got inside the plant and they were there. Um, so they could infect it. But they don't necessarily cause disease in that location on that particular plant. So there are there's some limits to our calling them pathogens. And it would be wonderful to do that, but that kind of work is a lot of work for one or two pathogens. We've got hundreds, so we've got a couple of decades worth of work ahead of us to figure those things out. So, to a symbiont? Is the same? so uh, they're all, for us, they're all symbionts. So um, because some they're growing inside the host. they grow inside the hosts. Some symbionts are pathogens. They're par parasites and, and are pathogens. Some symbionts are mutualists and beneficial. So, and some of these can can go either way depending on the environmental conditions. Yes. There's one online that we're going to ask. Uh, professor, professor Florentia Montagnini. Very interesting. Thanks. Wonder how specific your findings are to the particular ecosystems you studied. I imagine results would very strongly depend on species compositions, also whether you are comparing with organic farms. Oh, yeah. So our farm was organic. I think it would be interesting to look at conventional versus organic farms to see whether these kinds of relationships hold up. Um, I mean, I think we were so super surprised by how similar our three really different plant communities were in terms of the network structure. Um, if we, I think it would be fantastic if somebody would do that out here where you have rainy summers and um, really different kinds of environmental care um, conditions, but what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. And I think I'm heartened to think that this is probably relatively generalizable. All of this got started in a Panama rainforest, right? And then continued on into a variety of different kinds of settings, including global databases, and then the experiments that we've done in these three different communities. So I, I think the kinds of things that we're seeing are probably relatively robust to different kinds of plant ecosystems. And the take home message that phylogenetic signal in plant pathogen, and I'll, I'll, other people have done this also with herbivore, you know, plant herbivore interactions is something that's got a lot of practical useful use, use as well in that people are looking at how we can use that to predict which 
introduce pathogens or introduce herbivores are likely to be problematic problematic and what host species they're likely to go on to. And there's like so many um, realms where we can apply that kind of thing. And people are finding it to be useful in a lot of different ways. Awesome. Sorry about that there. I was yeah. saying, um, I told I told you. After that, they do we got the same kind of free country. <laughs> <laughs> but now we have a question like, what does that mean? I mean, that's what.